Yeah, isn't that fancy schmancy? 22 caliber action, ladies and gentlemen. Pretty solid. That door's not going anywhere. That deck screw. And this is the secret. So I'm just gonna go get my sledgehammer. It's nice, because I don't get to use it very often. Perfect, every time. Oh boy, let's see if this will go up. And instead of talking about it, let's get it done. I think we're gonna increase value in this kitchen. This is not acceptable. And that is money in the bank. This is where it gets fun. Fire in the hole! It's not the time to be putting out the big dollars. Thank you, here are we. Here's another tool you won't need to buy. Perfect, every time. So I'm over here at the client's house and I received an email a couple months ago, a young couple with a newborn baby, bought a house, they're moving in, so excited. They just needed me to come by and finish off the basement space. Now he's going to be doing a lot of the work himself, but he needed me to come in because there's a lot of areas here that he wasn't sure how to complete and there's a really simple reason why. It's because the person who did most of this work to this point didn't know what they were doing either. So this is the classic DIY. Somebody knew just enough to frame and put some drywall on, do some mudding. But there's a lot of little nuances here that just aren't up to snuff, right? So we have doors that need to be resized. We've got different drywall areas working around the beams. The framing didn't finish off with the concept of how we're gonna close off the ceiling. So I gotta get really creative here. So this project is all about helping you if you're in the same boat and you inherited a house and all the problems that go along with it. All right, so here we are in the basement. We're gonna do a little bit of interior framing. I'm gonna show you some basic techniques so that you can do it at home without running into trouble. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you'll know that I love my laser. And here's why, because that laser is on a stand. It gives me a line on the ground, up the wall, and across the ceiling. It shows me everywhere that this framing is going to start. Now, it's not very easy to see because Max has got some fabulous lighting in here to help everybody out. Wow. Here it is, okay. And we're gonna mark the ceiling. Now what this is gonna represent is the outside of the frame, not the inside. Very important to know what you're marking. So here we go. Now what we do is we just translate this information, okay? And then we put an X on the right side. Now we're ready to go. All we gotta do just put them roughly where they go and then start nailing it all together. Now, if you're going to be framing your basement, you might want to pick up a gun, something like this. A framing nailer. There's a three and a quarter inch nails. This one's at 34 degrees. It's very common. Most of the guns are the same angle. The idea is it sets the nail in straight and keeps all the hardware away from where you're working. With a gun like this, this is one time where I definitely agree with all the trolls, wear your safety glasses. Sooner or later, you're gonna run into a piece of lumber that's twisted, okay? Nail one end, take your handy dandy shark tooth hammer, which is why I love this hammer, lay it on the wood, and then you can twist into position a little bit past where you need it, and throw a couple of nails in, and that'll keep the stick straight and you won't have any problems with it warping ever again. Now it's done. Let's get these off so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. Now. Here's a little warning for you. If you have a tile floor above the area where you're building, take an extra quarter inch off your frame size so you don't have to jam it in. You want to just place it in, have a nice gap, use three inch screws to screw it all together with shims. Because the flooring up here is actually a, it's a laminate floor or carpet, I'm not worried about that, so I'm just going to go get my sledgehammer. It's nice because I don't get to use it very often. We're not going to go at it like crazy, just going to give it a love tap where it meets these floor joists. Find out where it's sticky. Okay, so now that it's all nice and plumb, and 
just a couple of fasteners right into the bottom of the floor joist. You don't run any mechanical through the plate into the bottom of a joist. So you're never gonna run a problem with your fastener being in the wrong spot. So the next section we're gonna cover is framing your door. There we go. That deck screw, you know, it still works. I'll keep that for later. Well, and here's the thing. Like, you can't use regular screw on a deck, but you can use a deck screw on regular lumber. So if you had an outdoor deck project and you had a bunch of screws left over, that's fine to use them, but that is not a three inch construction screw. That is barely even touching the bottom plate. <sighs> I'm gonna, huh. There's a good possibility that a lot of this might end up twisting up over time. Roll this this way off that drywall. Okay, don't have to be like that. <laughs> and now it's time to set up our laser to make sure we get a nice plumb line. I'm checking the board. It has a bit of a curve this way. I'm using my hand, I'm a little exaggerating. I'm gonna put an X on the outside, okay? And then I'm gonna check this piece for the same thing. Okay, now they're both relatively straight, but the little bit of curve that's in them is letting us know what their intention is down the road. <laughs> if you put both of them together like this, that have this curve, okay, it'll go together real easy. You put it in the wall and it'll just wanna keep on curving. And so eventually that frame will push into the door, cause you problems. If you take the curves like this and then screw them together, then they're gonna be fighting against each other the whole time and the screws will hold it in place and your doors will never get sticky. 228 centimeters. I think I read that right for all of our European friends. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> Real quick, I'll show you a little trick. I love doing this because in this situation, we're in our basement, we're renovating. We don't have a lot of electrical down here. It still has to be all wired up later this afternoon. So all I have is two plugs, one for the compressor, one for the lights and a skill saw. So it's easier to move this around the basement as I'm working than to have my chop saw set up and trying to run continuous power to it. Basically what we're doing here is we're setting our guide on my mark, bringing the speed square up to the plate. And I'm gonna hold the square in place. And then this provides me something to run the saw against so I get a straight cut. Now, make sure you don't cut your legs off like an idiot. But if you're holding this right and you're pushing straight and you have a sharp blade, it'll never bind, it'll never kick back. If you're finding this, you're fighting with your saw, it's time for a new blade. Invest in it, because that is when an accident's gonna happen. And if you're not comfortable with this, set the chop saw up outside and run up and down the stairs 300 times. <laughs> That's pretty damn exact, isn't it? Woohoo! right where we want it. And before I bury the head, make sure you're good here. You got a bit of an overhang. Remember, when you're on an angle, it'll drive this, the wood forward. So I'm just gonna drive forward, but I'm gonna check here, make sure that that gap closes. Put this one in. This plate has been fastened to the concrete with these nails here. Explosive hammer. So I'm just gonna trim this back out of our way. Perfect. Yeah, I'm starting to get a little nervous. It's getting a little late. The, the storm has caused a real issue around here because we had tornadoes. So it caused so much damage that all the electricians in Ottawa are like book solid for a month. I mean, it was hard enough getting a good electrician as it was, but now we've compounded the issue. So I'm south of town and I got on the ESA site, uh, the Electrical Safety Authority, and I'm calling every electrician within 100 miles of where I am. Finally got a hold of somebody that had a cancellation today. I was talking to him last night, and he's supposed to be coming by about an hour ago. <laughs> Hopefully nothing has happened, because if I can't get an electrician in here today, I gotta be about a month before I can get this thing wired, and uh, this will be a really long project. Drive you crazy.
Well, I absolutely love it when a plan comes together. The only thing missing from this job site is a cigar. <laughs> we are just a couple days in. The electrician has obviously been here. Managed to get this whole place wired and call in for an inspection, which is brilliant. Uh, we got all of our wall framing finished. Basically, we don't have it tied in. So this is the thing. We were a little on a tight line and the electrician was available. So what I did is I cheated with the way I framed this place and I put everything in place that I needed to run the wiring. Today we are coming back to finish. So we we're going to talk about how to tie into the floors and the ceilings, the steel beams, do some bulkhead work, <sighs> finish off all the details and then be time to order some drywall. <laughs> okay, so we put this wall up a couple days ago and had the electricians come in and we needed this wall because there was going to be a plug here. The rest of this piece of wall section uh, we built separately and I installed it yesterday while the electricians were working and it's just here. And basically what we did is we just measured the gap on the floor, the gap on the ceiling, made my top and bottom plates, built it, stuck it in, added this brace here. Now this is important. This brace is added so that the middle of the wall is also tied to this wall and that'll keep these things from moving independently and causing cracks in the drywall. The only thing that's left here to do is a little back framing and that's part of the drywall process. Just before we go do drywall, we walk around with a bunch of one by fours and we tie things in like that just to have a screw surface for the drywall. But we can do that while we're getting our waiting for our drywall delivery tomorrow. Today we are going to attach our plate. That's the last thing to do. So the ceiling is already screwed in place. This wall was wedged in place pretty good, but we have our marks on the ground to make sure that everything is still level and square from the laser line. And now we're just gonna to attach to the concrete for good measure. Now you can use the tap cons, get your drill out and drill a hole and attach it. Now here's my new ram set. This is awesome, it's trigger action. One shot, so you have to have a pellet. And these little ram sets, they come in different strengths and they're color coded. So yellow is number four. This is ideal for concrete. If you wanted to go with the number five for steel, you can. And we just put that shot in there, right? But we always put the nail in first. You don't want to be working with this and accidentally hit the trigger. So put your nail in, put it where you want to put it in the concrete, then add the shot, okay? And then we just set it down and then you lock it in position just a little bit more, pull the trigger. Bam! 22 caliber action, ladies and gentlemen. Gets the job done every time. Fire in the hole! This is an interior separation wall, and it is on concrete and under seal. Now, we did a video on another basement project. Man, must be a year and a half ago now. Uh, we showed you how to attach a plate like this into steel. And we used a pre-drill and then a steel screw system, and that works great, but it's not always necessary. So if we're gonna assume that the top is where it needs to be, I'm gonna look at this bubble here and I'm gonna play around nice. And by putting the level on the steel and then pushing the wood into it and making that nice full contact, you know, these six foot levels, they really come in handy. We're gonna get a couple of fasteners in here and then I'm gonna show you how to attach the top. And just a quick word of warning, if you're a DIYer and you have travel plans, Make sure if you're using that gun, you have a really good shower before you go try and get in through an airport. Because if you get so randomly selected for a gunshot residue test, you will fail. And they will have some interesting conversations with you in the back room all by yourself. I know that might sound crazy, but don't wear the same shoes you travel with either. Because those sniffer dogs, they'll pick that up off your shoes. Man, they will not be happy to find you. <sighs> top plates. This is awesome. I love top plates. Remember, nothing here is structural. The steel is. That's the only thing that's not going anywhere. So what we're gonna do is attach to the steel. And I have a great system for doing that. And it's gonna offend some people. <laughs> because it's so good, you're gonna go, why didn't I think of that? Right? Construction adhesive. This is awesome. This stuff sticks to everything in every weather and every kind of temperature. And all we're gonna do here, folks, is load that up with the adhesive and shove our shim right in the middle of it. Oh yeah. And we're just laminating and gluing these things together. And it's gonna get a little bit messy. Make sure it's nice and flush. Leave it to dry until tomorrow. Okay, come back, take your knife, trim it all off. Boom, you're done. 
whew, do not expect your nail to go bury in there. It is in the steel, probably like an eighth of an inch, but it's enough to keep this thing from moving around now. That way you aren't going to have an accident while you're working for the rest of the day. Come back in the morning and find this all glued together a half an inch out of place. Perfect every time. So if you're renovating your basement, guaranteed you're going to need to know how to build a bulkhead. Because every home that I've ever been in that has a basement has a heating and cooling system. So in between the beam, I like to build it exactly the same as beside the beam. Now this is my system that I've developed and it works like a charm. I go to Home Depot, I buy some 7 16 chipboard. It's just exterior aspenite. It's nice and cheap. And I screw two by twos to it. All right. And the way I do it is I offset it three inches. That way I can attach them like a Tetris puzzle, build really long boxes and screw it all together. Now the best part of this system is when you're putting in something in between the ductwork, uh, it's not rocket science, it's not measuring, it's just getting it in the middle. Try not to install it over top of these little brackets and screws, it creates an uneven surface. So you want to get flush to the wood, keep the wires to one side or another if you're putting in pot lights, and all you do is lift it into place roughly because we're just carrying a little extra load. Because this is 7 16 it's not that heavy, and you can do this alone. One of the reasons this works so well is because the houses today have got engineered floor joists. So you don't have to worry about the crown of a floor joist up and down and uneven. It's usually really, really flat. So you can trust that the surface I'm screwing to is already level and flat. So if we're working off the floor joist or the steel, it's all the same thing because the steel determines how flat the floor is going to be and the engineered floor joists keep it that way. So everything we attach, if we pre-make it, cut it and drill it, screw it together, we can just install it that quick and simple. It's like working with Lego. So we're going to install our wood into our floor joist package. <laughs> And then just press this in. <clears throat> where, oh where does my laser go? So what I've got is I've got a, a line here and I want to judge, I want to go off of lumber, which is flush with the steel, and I want to put a mark here. And I'm reading my tape, it says 64 inches. All right, now I am 63 and a half. Okay, so before you go touch anything else, add the half an inch to the laser line, make a mark. Now, all you have to do with the tape measure put away and the marker put away is go back to your laser and line up the two dots. I'm just moving the base over. Okay, there we go. Now I have a line on my ceiling that's perfectly parallel to the other steel beam, which is what that wall is built under. Once that ceiling line is straight, the only other thing I have to worry about is whether or not my bulkhead is square to the ceiling. Screw those two panels together, just like that, done. And you can see, this stuff is not straight. That's fine, I'm only holding up drywall. I still have to put an outside corner on and do all my mud work. So what I do is I take the bow in this board and I actually put the bow so it's like my bow is like this towards the wood and I'm installing it flush on the bottom. Now I'll use five screws for eight feet. Okay. Now you can see on the camera it's pretty good. The top is perfect. The bottom's got a little bit of a wave to it because it hasn't been supported yet. That's why I mentioned it's important. Make sure that you use the square, get it done perfect. But what you have overall is a pretty straight line. Because this is so flexible, any of the other waves will be taken out while I put the ceiling in. Well, there we go. We've taught you how to frame an entire basement so that you can finish your whole project by yourself. Just remember the one of the most important things when it comes to framing is when you're done. Clean up, put your tools away, make sure you unplug any power tools, Sweep up, keep a clean sight. Remember, your kids and your pets aren't going to be as careful walking around as you will be, all right? Okay, so quick update. We've got the wiring done, the framing is done. 
our bulkheads are in. Now we're at a place where we are ready to order some drywall. So before we do that, we want to just go around and check from the electrical and repair all of our vapor barrier and insulation work. Now this house came with all the insulation installed. It's R20 right to the ground and it came with a vapor barrier, but it's been disturbed because of the process of running wiring. Now remember, your electrician is not going to go back and make sure that is all up to snuff. So before you get too excited and move forward, this is your opportunity to go around and make sure all this is taken care of, okay? Now this basement is uh, kind of half sunk. The first few feet are above ground, the rest is underground. But this is what you're going to see, folks. See, this is an electrician moving stuff out of his way, and you've got to repair this, all right? Vapor barriers are all cut, the wires are all run. But what he isn't going to do is he's not going to cut the insulation around the new boxes. So the proper technique for insulation, all right, is to actually cut the insulation away from where the box is going to be in the wall so that it sits properly in that hole around all this. Now, we want to tuck the wires nice and back and behind there and allow this insulation to come right snug to the wood again in behind all of our vapor barrier, okay, there. Now, this plastic here as well needs to be cut to fit around the box so that it can be stretched nice and straight and then taped on properly. Now this is the vapor barrier that goes for the plug. There we go, all right. Now in a lot of cases, this is gonna be cut where it's convenient for the electrician, which is not on a stud. It is a real pain in the butt. So, I just wish electricians would cut down the middle of the board so I can tape it up again. Uh, like stitches, okay? Every couple of feet, you wanna put another one of these stitches on, we're gonna call it, for lack of a better term, so that we can close up the gap, so that we can actually put a little bit of pressure on that tape, all right? Now, now when you put that over the seam, all the plastic is stretched tight enough that you can actually get a good seal. There you go. Now in a perfect world, everybody in construction would think about the next guy, but nobody ever does, all right? Everybody's getting paid to do their job as quick as they can to whatever code requirement that's out there. Now remember, because he's done this does not mean that's sealed. You still need to tape that electrical box to your plastic. Now how good a seal that makes is really up to you. It's not gonna be that great because there's no backing here. Okay, so go nice and big, really overlap it. I know the tape is expensive, but you get a lot of linear feet in a roll. Don't be cheap. Make sure you got a good seal, or there's no point in having it there at all. So anywhere where you have a penetration in the vapor barrier, it's not good enough to tuck plastic around it, okay? Seal it up, get your tape out, do a bunch of different pieces if you have to to go around things that are round. Take a look around your room, double check that the insulation is tied up in all the plates, because this is what you're gonna see. Time and time again, you're gonna see the plastic's cut open, the insulation's tucked behind the box instead of cut around it. That's wrong. You're gonna see corners pulled out of the way. You know what, here's another situation. Let me just show you this real quick. Okay, the way you fix this is pull your insulation out. And you know there's enough there, because it was there in the beginning, all right? Pull it apart like this, put some in behind, all right? Push the wires back and then tuck the rest in front. You're also gonna see situations up here like this where they went through the plate and they pulled the vapor barrier out of the way to run the wires over to the light fixtures. This is another situation, cut your plastic, put it around. And if you don't wanna to try to tape all that up, you can actually buy an acoustic sealant is what it's called. And it comes in a caulking gun and you can just goop that all up so that you don't have air moving. And if you don't have air moving with a polyurethane sealant, then you won't have vapor loss either. So that's what you gotta do to make sure that everything is nice and tight, no air leaks, no moisture transferring back and forth from the wall, and your basement will stay nice and comfortable. <sighs> Looks like I got a lot of work to do before I can even think about putting drywall. <laughs> All right, welcome back. This job is coming along just like organized. We have 
day three here now. We are already past our electrical inspection. We've got our drywall delivered. Came in the rain yesterday. That was a lot of fun. We got a roll off bin coming today so we can start getting all of our sheets installed and garbage straight to the bin outside. That'll help keep the site clean. And today we get to focus on doing our soundproofing. So like a lot of people, they need to have nice quiet space in their basement and it is a hard thing to achieve. So we better get working. Just a regular fiberglass bat has so much air pocket in it that it absorbs and it helps to dampen the sound. And so since we're gonna do a really, really intense system here, I'm gonna put some insulation in this cavity just so that it's not redundant. I don't want the noise from that room coming across and down through the ceiling. Nah, that's old school. <laughs> the old fiberglass bats used to have glass. You need to wear gloves. A lot of the newer products, it's a lot easier on the hands. And I've been working with these hands for so many years it doesn't bother me. So I've got my drywall lift here. This is an awesome tool. Amazing when you're working alone. <laughs> it goes together that easy. Now, so we're using 10 foot sheets of 5 8 fire code drywall. And the reason for that is because it's in super dense. It's also super heavy. So we're using the drywall lift because there's no way I can install this on a ceiling by myself. But with the assistance of the lift, that's probably quite easy to do, except for lifting it in place. Dear God, Max was like, oh, I wanna see if you can put that up there all by yourself. Now, the trick to this is of course, have the drywall white paper facing the lift so that when you install it, it's facing down. You don't wanna go through all the trouble of lifting this up and then putting it on the wrong direction. Oh boy, let's see if this will go up. Now, I think we got it. Lift it in place, roughly. <laughs> All right, dear Lord. Because we're going to be using another layer of drywall, I'm gonna use a two inch, sorry, two and a half inch screw at that point. And then I'll go with more screws. All right, so this is green glue. This is acoustic sealant. This is actually um, not designed to seal as much as to create a ridge of the sealant so that when you press it up and screw it into place, it leaves a tiny air gap between the two drywall sheets. And apparently that is going to kill most of the sound in this room. It works really well if you can have somewhat of a consistent bead and it runs about one tube per every sheet of drywall. And if you're applying it in this sort of a manner, you will have enough to get it on a sheet of drywall. It runs about 20 bucks a sheet, but this green stuff gives you another sound rating, believe it or not, of about five. Five, just for the caulking. Now, we're gonna stagger the joints. So this time, we're gonna start on the outside wall coming back this way. Now we've got five eighths plus five eighths, which makes inch and a quarter. So I've gotta use a two and a half inch screw. I wanna have at least an inch of thread in the wood on the bottom of these just to make sure I got positive contact. Come on, baby. Here we go. 
Oh. Oh. All right. Yeah, you can do it alone. But dear God, <laughs> even if you have to owe your neighbor a favor, it's probably worth it to get some help. <laughs> well, welcome back to our job site. It's been a couple of days. We got a lot of the drywall work hung now. Um, you can see that we've come a long way. We've got a few things left to do. And a lot of the stuff that we're gonna do today is like the finishing touches, the tips, the tricks. Uh, little problem solving kind of things, right? So hanging drywall in odd spots and doing some creative building. So we're looking forward to getting all this closed up today so that way we can get taping and putting on our corners and get on to the finishing phase. It's really nice to get all the drywall up because that's when you turn the page from building to finishing. Huh, let's get going. So if you're renovating your basement, you're gonna run into a variety of different problems. You're gonna run into um, drywall that's not long enough for the wall. How do you seam it? How do you splice it? You're gonna run into boxes that aren't hanging low enough to put your fixtures on. You're gonna run into taping problems and how to finish everything just the way you want to. How to finish up the window, because not everybody wants to put in window jam and casing, it's rather expensive. You can go drywall right to the window, but you gotta know this trick. So we're gonna show you in this video different tools that'll speed up the process. It'll help make an amateur taper like yourself do the job a lot faster and still get a great result. And we're gonna show you tips and tricks for what to do when you screw up. Because if you're new in drywall, you're gonna make mistakes. And the key to this is knowing how to fix your mistakes and still have it finished perfect. Because you don't wanna get all through the project and then just to paint it and start seeing cracking everywhere. So stay with us today. We're gonna to show you at least a dozen things that you need to know to get a great job. Trick number one. When you're gonna screw drywall in, use one of these bad boys. This is a drywall dimpler bit. <laughs> No matter how hard you push, that nasty sound at the end is the bit wasting its time. It always sets a perfect depth, all right? Okay, the next trick I'm gonna show you is how to use a cutout tool. Now listen, if you don't have a cutout tool, you need to buy one, all right? If you're gonna do a basement renovation without a cutout tool, you're crazy. It's gonna cost you a fortune in repairing and fixing all the holes that you build. Voila. And that is perfect every time. Trick number three is using the mesh tape. It's got an adhesive on it. And the corners are the trickiest spot. So you wanna stretch it and press it. And then only put pressure from one side, sliding it right into the corner. So that, I gotta pull this in. This bad boy here does corners, okay? Doesn't do corners perfectly, but for a DIY or doing a basement, it does a pretty darn good corner. And you can press that into your fiber and it'll set the tape perfectly for you. Also, because that edge here, see that edge? It's not 90 degrees, it's got a rounded, it, bit of a bevel. It won't cut the fiber, all right? The next trick is to use a wheel for your paper tape. And this sucker just sticks down here pretty easily. And once you've got this set up, you just slide it on your belt. Now I am always wearing a belt, just the nature of the beast. So, this can just be sitting on your hip and you can pull the tape off as you need it. You can tear it, do your work, and it's always right there for you again the next time you need it. The next trick is if you make a mistake when you're doing your drywall and you find that your ceiling boxes for your light are too deep. If they're recessed too deep and there's a gap between the box and the drywall, you'll fail your electrical inspection, all right? So instead of ripping your ceiling apart and undoing your box and remounting it and going through all that hassle, you can cheat. You can buy what's called a box extender. Now, what this does is it just sets on the existing screws, you tighten that up, and it makes your box another half inch thicker. The next trick I'm gonna show you is the use of J-Trim. Now, it's not that tricky. We just basically take our trim, we set it on like this, and we roll it over. And there you go. So now you have a finished rough edge of drywall that has a finished edge. So the next trick we're gonna teach you guys is about bulkheads. 3M61, okay? The way we install this is we put a nice little bead. You see they even color it for you so you know that your glue is going on. Isn't that fancy schmancy? Run that glue down that corner bead. Okay, now 
So I'm gonna put in a spring-loaded trap door right here. So you can see here that the way this is designed, it creates compression. So this is my drywall and I cut a hole, this is on an angle, and then over here, this slides, all right? So if I cut the hole just a little bit smaller than this square, I'm not gonna have much compression. It's gonna be sloppy. And I'm thinking that'll be good here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it just makes this real easy. And you open and close it both in the same direction. And just go like that until you can slide that end up. Done. So here's the irony. We're making this video and I did the spring-loaded door. I come down off the ladder and I look over and I see the can sitting in the ceiling. I'm like, whoops, I forgot to put one of the elbows on my heat run and I close it up. So while we're at this making a video, I'm gonna show you how to do this because this is a great trick. So we're just gonna cut a smaller piece out. Yep, full of dust. Now, a little dust isn't gonna kill you, but uh, if you really want it, you could wear safety glasses. I don't really care about a little bit of dust. I got tear ducts. So I have a windshield washer solution in my face that cleans all that out. When you're all finished painting, you just compress that in there. Perfect every time. The other awesome thing about this tool is that when you're hanging a sheet of drywall over a huge window, you can put it up as one sheet so you keep the integrity of the sheet. If you try to cut the window out first and then install it, you run the risk of not being square or breaking the joint when you're installing. This way you just throw it up, add some screws, and zip. Of course, throwing a couple screws in there, I'll help keep control. There we go. Ah, I can see again. It's silky smooth. Okay, so that was really cool fixing that patch up. Now, if you're using your Rotozip and you're new to it, make sure you go counterclockwise. And if you make a mistake and run off and make a huge chunk out of the wall, that's okay. CGC makes these awesome outlet patches, okay? This is like corner mesh tape, but it's a lot thicker, it's perforated, and it's already the size of your box. So, what you can do is you can just put mud on the area, press one of these in place, let it dry, and then you can finish it, and it'll give you a nice strong area around the patch if you just fill it with mud and then paint, it's gonna end up cracking after the light plate goes on at some point, and you're gonna be really disappointed. You went through all that work just to be disappointed with a crack. So use something like that, or lots and lots of paper tape. This is just really handy. Well, there we have it. Finally, we are closed up and ready to tape. Now we are moving from building to finishing. So glad, because I am really enjoying the idea of finishing. Spending the next few days doing some taping and making everything around here look just perfect. That's my idea of a good work week. Listen, we are uh, going to be about three days getting this job taped. Perfect time of year. It's October. It's getting a little cool, which means the furnace is on. And that means my mud is going to dry awesome. So about three days of taping, we'll be ready to sand and prime. Before you know it, we're going to have the homeowner down here doing his own flooring. I'm going to take a week off. <laughs> After we're done our taping, of course we'll sand and prime, and then it's time to install the doors. Now this is really cool. We're going to be doing a video of three different ways you can install a pre-hung door, so make sure you check that out. We'll put the link in the description for that below. 
And then keep your eyes open. We're also going to be installing a double French door here in this office. And so we're going to show you all the hardware and all the tips and tricks for getting that installed. Man, oh man, oh man, I love my job. So here we are, we all sanded and primed. It's been about a week. Um, sometimes basements, especially in the fall, it can take a little while to get things to dry the way you want to. It's difficult to bring in air blowers because then you get all the dirt mixed in with your mud. And so it's been about a week and we're at a point where I'm ready to prime check. And then we're gonna paint the ceilings and get some doors hung. Whew, that'll feel real good. So next week it'll be all about finishing the paintwork and the flooring and the finished trim. And then we're out of here. So one of the most basic skill sets that any home renovator is going to need is to know how to paint a ceiling and do a nice job of it. Because there are a lot of ways that you can really make a mess of your house if you don't know how to paint a ceiling properly. We've all seen the house before, right? The smooth ceiling, lots of pot lights, patches everywhere, lines everywhere. Yes, there is a secret to get a job done without having any of that ugly stuff showing. And it makes it look like one clean finish. And I'm not talking about sprayer. I'm talking about brush and roller. And I'm going to show you all that secret today. We have to add the sanding of their, our drywall work and priming the drywall before we get into painting the ceiling. And that's really simple. I like using these little blue sponges with the curve on it. All right. These things are awesome because I can get right into my corners without putting a scratch line. I've seen a lot of these things and they're square on both ends. If you put that up here like this and then drag it across, I'll show you what happens. You end up with a line on your ceiling, okay? That's not something you wanna have there. So buy one of these at the angle and then you can hit both sides of that corner and make it look pretty. The only other thing, take your 360 sander, put it up on your joints, all right? And go opposite direction that you put the mud on just to change the texture of the mud. Now this is really important because the paper is really smooth. The mud isn't always as smooth as you think it is. And just by going like this, nice and easy, you'll put a little bit of sanding on it, change the texture of mud, and now it's ready to be painted. When you're priming, don't run the roller right into that corner because you're gonna end up marking up your paint on the corresponding wall. The other secret is prime in the same direction that you're going to want to be painting with your finished paint. Remember when we paint ceilings we can do two coats. So the second coat you want to be painting the same direction as your second coat and that's going to be determined by a couple of different things. <sighs> Generally when I'm painting a ceiling if I have a window that's facing south then I want to make sure if the sun's pouring through a window that I'm finishing the paint in the same direction as the sun. So if there is any little lines or ridges even on the microscopic level Sun pouring across the ceiling will highlight it with a shadow. Once we're done our primer, we want to jump right into doing the prime check as soon as it's dry for about two hours. So I'm going to just use a standard treble light. Comes on usually like a 25 foot cord, 100 watt bulb, and that'll show me all of my mistakes. So wow, now you can see all the little pits and nicks and scratches. Now they're all smooth. They've all been sanded, right? So now we just try to take our compound and slide ourselves over here. Oh. And this is just a result. Bulkheads are really brutal, right? Because you're taping an outside corner, you're taping an inside corner. Usually this area here, it's gonna get a combination of, of too much mud or not enough mud. So we're just about to jump into the painting, but I wanna show you this real quick. This is my prime check touch up area. And I need to give it a quick little scuff here. There we go. Drop the mic, we're done. Now, my spots need to be primed because I use regular mud. And instead of using a regular primer, um, having to wait 20 minutes, half an hour, I'm gonna use this, because this sucker here, boom, done in three minutes, ready to go. Here we go. So basically my, my process is this. I roll the long wall, and then I'll come and cut, and then I'll give it another an hour and a half quick sand with my 360 sander, and then I'll cut and then roll. Do it in the reverse order. So the goal here is to paint long, even strokes, okay? Because the longer you roll it out, here we go, the more you can keep your edges wet, all right? The edge of the paint at the front here, this is the line you want to keep wet all the time. So here's the reason why I'm using single gallons of paint for my ceiling. And I'm doing an entire basement here, all right? So I could have bought a five gallon pail, 
But here's what happens. When you open the five gallon pail and you start pouring it out, by the time you finish all of the projects, there's so much air going into that pail that now the paint's starting to dry and get little crumbs and dirt in it. So what I like to use is one gallon at a time. I'll pour three quarters of a gallon into my paint tray, use the rest as my cutting can. And now it's easy to run around and just touch this up. Make sure that everything is coated. Don't get lazy with this and only do it on the second coat. It will show and you'll see a dark line around your ceiling. So make sure you get your cutting done. And then it's a great time to go for coffee. And then come back, we'll cut again and then roll the short side. Then the ceiling's done. So one of the coolest finishing touches for a basement is LED pot lights. Now this design here is really kind of neat. It's just a quick connect. So you just got to cut your hole up in the ceiling, pull down your cable. When the electrician comes, when he's first doing the rough in, he does all the wiring into the control box. And then what we do is we hang it up in the ceiling and all this is out of the way. And then when we're completely done painting, we come and draw the lines using our laser level to mark all of our spots. And you just quick connect give it a twist, and then you pop it in. This is the most amazing way to finish off your light because you don't have to pay an electrician to do that second step. So we bought these lights here. There come 16 in a box. It's like a big contractor pack at the local building store. The only thing it didn't come with is a cutting template for cutting the hole in your ceiling. And here's the issue. There's not much space between the edge of this screw and the edge of that. You really want to make this nice and tight. So here's a secret that I use. Just lay that down on some cardboard and trace yourself a line. And now you've got a line. I want you to then take another eighth of an inch and trace a second line. Now, then you just take your utility knife and cut through your cardboard. And that way, <clears throat> When you put this up on the ceiling now, you're going to trace your line out. <laughs> I see Billy and Max. You're going to trace your line out, cut it with your hand drywall saw, and then you're guaranteed that the, the cover of this trim is going to overlap that cut, and you're not going to have an ugly hole sticking out. And that's all you need. All right, so that is how you make a cutting flange to install your lights. Today we're talking about installing pre-hung doors. That's right, we got three different ways to do it. Stay with us, we're gonna show you all of our tips and tricks. There you go. Now leave it up to manufacturers to be forever inventing new and stupid ways to try to put these plugs in. There we go. And then you have to pop your pins. Yeah, not a lot of mercy here. <laughs> this is sinking on this side. Pretty dang perfect. Just close the door. All right, door number two, we're gonna do the quick and easy way. And this costs a few bucks, I'm gonna warn you. That looks pretty good. I'm liking that. I'm thinking we can install the door there. All right, this is method number three. This is what I call the cheapest. pretty solid. That door's not going anywhere. Loving it. So one of the most complicated doors that you can install in your home, of course, is the French door. Well, this project is moving along okay. A little slower than I'd expected. Uh, a couple weeks back, I had a fall at my own house. 
<sighs> Can't wait to recap my stairs. I landed on my back and so it's kind of slowing me down a little bit, just to be honest with you. Um, but we are at the finishing stages now. Finally, all the flooring is in and that's something the homeowner in this job has done themselves. So we aren't going to be showing you videos on that. So we will link in the description below a how to install laminate or vinyl flooring video that we think is applicable in case when you're watching this video, you'd like to see how to do that. Uh, we've got finished carpentry going on everywhere, including behind us. This is a shiplap wall. And this is a great little idea if you want to be putting up a lot of pictures and moving things around over time. You've got a surface that you can screw into, unlike drywall, so it'll facilitate all kinds of great stuff there. Today, we are trying to finish off our carpentry, get some doors installed, finish off trimming out our playroom, and hopefully, we have about another week to finish all of our paint, do all of our caulking, all of our finishing trim, paint our doors. There's still a lot of work to do, but it's, you can see the end from this part now, and I'm really excited to get this sucker done. So let's get it going. we got about another hard week of work to do, and then we'll be able to show you all the before and afters at the end of the video. All right, so on our accent wall here, we're actually installing this little shiplap product. It's a bit of a knockoff. It's not even wood. It's an MDF, and you can see that it has that whole little Tetris look to it, and that makes it a really cool design to install. Also makes it a bit of a challenge because... You don't want to have a bunch of surface nails going through MDF. You'll be puttying up the holes forever. So what we want to do here is just a couple things you need to know about this. It does not come all the same length. It comes in 10 foot boards, but give or take 3 eighths of an inch. So if you're going to do this, realize you're going to have to start with a square, or sorry, a plumb line, and then you're going to have to cut every one of your boards to fit. So what I like to do, just so that I can make my life easier, is use a really sharp pencil, mark my spot, cut my board, install one at a time. <sighs> this is very satisfying work, and it only takes about an hour to put the whole wall up. What we're going to do is use this awesome adhesive. It's called No Nails. And we're just going to mark a few spots here that we can use to hold that board in place. Okay, so here's our entertainment wall, and we've got a bunch of speaker wire and Pat 6 coming through here. The idea being we're going to have a TV mounted and we want to run our wires in the wall cavity. So you got a couple of options here. We have a traditional, right, this is a low voltage box, it's a retrofit. So you can put this anywhere on this wall and you can cut it in, you tighten the screws and then these little wings come out and create a compression fit on the drywall. That's an option. Or you can get one of these bad boys. Now, this is interesting because that option requires a finishing plate, where this one is designed to install in the same fashion with that screw compression fit, right? But you put this on at the very end. So this part here actually is going to be inside the wall. So you want your drywall cut beside it. Give yourself one eighth of an inch on all four sides when you're cutting. Slide that in, boom, tighten the screws. Ta-da! So one of the secrets that I like to incorporate when I'm working on a small box or something like this, when I'm trimming, is don't worry about being perfect with the measurement. When you're putting this all together, Nothing is going to be perfectly angled. Nothing's going to be a perfect measurement. Nothing's going to be a perfect cut. So make the error by making everything just a little bit bigger than is necessary. Because what we're going to do is we're going to install this with our no nails adhesive. And we can use a real thick bead. And I'll show you how this is done in a second. But first, I'm going to cut both my outside corners on my saw. I love my saw here, first of all, because if I keep the wheel in the back loose, whenever I want to make my outside corners, done. All right, now I do. Come up to that pencil mark that we make on the wall, cut from the back side, and you've already automatically got your outside corner. I'm just going to put a little bit on the joint, 
so it doesn't crack over time. But this is the secret right here. Nice thick bead. We're gonna go in here like this, make a gentle contact, and just squeeze these corners together until everything is perfect. For good measure, you can toss in a nail or two, but put them in an obscure place. There you go. So I'm installing this vent here, and I realized that the cutout was done absolutely horrible. I'm not sure what I was drinking at the time, but that's nasty. Here's the secret to solve that problem. Take a couple of screws, put them into the uh, supporting framework. That's how you install a grill. No screws and fully functional. All right, and this is my favorite way to install window trim. And if you wanna know how to do this, we actually did this video and I'm gonna put a link in the description of the video below. So you may have seen our videos before on all of our flooring installation techniques. The one thing that we never covered was the transitions. And there's a reason we never did it, it's because we were waiting for the opportunity to cover all the information that we need to give you to do it properly. Now, right down here, we're gonna take a look at what a finished floor transition should look like. You will notice that it is exactly underneath where this door is going to close to, all right? And the secret to that is installing your flooring just a little bit to the inside of the jam and right under just a little inside the door stop. You really want to leave a three quarter inch gap at the maximum all the way across. All right. All right, so now all I gotta do is trim out this door, and then we're gonna be back in just a few seconds with all the before and after shots of this awesome basement transformation. As you can see, this space is completely different now than it's finished. I mean, before they had a few walls up, they probably could have had a TV room set up down here, but that was very limited, very cold, and very ugly. Having done this now, you're raising value in your home, increasing the living space, and you have all kinds of options for enjoying this down here. Reality is, guys, one person can do this alone, because I did. I renovated this on my own, just so that I could show you that if you're a homeowner by yourself, you can do this. And we have all of the videos and instructions necessary in our channel. So we're gonna put links in the description below for the playlist for this basement, the playlist for our other basement job, and that'll give you all the information you need to be able to do something like this for yourself. Building material wise, it's not expensive to do drywall and flooring. So go ahead, dare to dream, and I dare you to renovate your own basement and then send us the pics so that we can see what you did. If you like this kind of information, hit the share button. Share this with people, encourage them, inspire them. Let's start making a change in society where we are taking pride in our homes and we're going to elevate ourselves in our position in life by fixing up our own house. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Reality Renovision. If you're new to our channel, then I suggest you subscribe to the channel over here. Don't forget to hit the bell icon for notifications so you'll be told every time a new video comes up. And if you'd like, you can click the link right here and you can binge watch all the episodes that we have on our playlist amazing information, everything DIY and decor and renovation and remodeling. Thanks for joining us.